What would you do if you knew you only had two minutes to live? Just two minutes. Say goodbye to your loved ones? Make peace with your maker? Beg for forgiveness? Do that one thing you've waited your whole life to do? Or just collapse on the ground and sob? It's not an easy question to answer, but it is an even more difficult problem when you don't know that you have only two minutes to live. For 30,000 people in the city of St. Pierre, on the Caribbean island of Martinique, in the year 1902, they saw and heard the volcano blow its top. They just didn't know what was going to happen next. Greetings, kittens. Welcome to the Podcast of Doom, the podcast devoted to epic failure analysis. My name is David Appleson. In this episode, we will look at a natural disaster that completely wiped out one town. On the morning of May 8, 1902, a volcano known as Mount Pele exploded on the small island of Martinique, a French colony in the Caribbean Sea. When the volcano erupted, it launched what is known as a pyroclastic surge, a deadly stream of steam and ash that rumbled down the hillside and obliterated the plantations and villages in its path before flattening the picturesque town of St. Pierre. The surge thundered into the town's bay where it sank 18 ships and hundreds of smaller crafts. Within two minutes, nearly all of the 30,000 residents of St. Pierre were dead, but the town itself would remain burning for days. The greatest tragedy may have been that so many of the deaths could have been avoided if it hadn't been for the ambitions of one politically motivated newspaper publisher. For more than 100 years following the landing of Christopher Columbus on the island of Martinique, things remained quiet for the local Caribbean Indians. That changed in 1635 when the French claimed the island as their own. The first order of business was to build a fort on a location with a sweeping view of the surrounding terrain and waters. They named it Fort St. Pierre in honor of St. Peter. For the next few years, the town continued to grow with the arrival of more settlers from France. In 1642, King Louis XIII authorized the use of slaves in the French Caribbean. Not much later, sugarcane was introduced as a crop, and soon Martinique was exporting vast quantities of sugar while importing huge numbers of African slaves to cut and gather the product. The economy of Martinique was soon booming. In 1685, France imposed its Code Noir on all of its colonies, granting slaves certain rights, such as limited working hours, standards for food and housing, and restrictions on punishment. This code raised the living standard of the Martinique slaves, who had more rights than the few remaining indigenous Caribe Indians who were slowly being forced off their lands while being butchered in the process. As a prosperous colony, Martinique had two things going for it a natural deep water port near the town of St. Pierre, and rich fertile soil due to its intermittent inactivity of the volcano Mount Pele on the northern end of the island. The population of St. Pierre mushroomed with the migration of planters, merchants, businessmen, shippers, shipwrights, and of course slaves. In 1789, the French Revolution spilled over into Martinique. The plantation owners supported the monarchy, while the merchant class supported the republic. In 1794, the republicans captured the strategically important Fort Royal and immediately sought ways to legitimize their claim to governance of the island. They drew up and adopted a new code of law. They made the abolition of slavery the centerpiece of this new code. The royalist planters objected and they signed a secret agreement with the English who invaded and remained on the island for the next six years. Meanwhile, the Martinique-born Vicomte and General Alexander de Beauharnais, veteran of the American Revolutionary War and member of the French National Assembly, fell victim to the guillotine in Paris. His widow, a Creole, Marie Joseph, also known as Josephine, took a second husband six years her junior, he happened to be a Corsican by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte, and he was about to take control of most of continental Europe. Napoleon recovered the island for the French. With advice from his native-born wife, Napoleon struck down the abolition statute to appease the plantation owners, and Martinique was once again a slave island. In 1834, England abolished slavery in all of its colonies, 
Thousands of Martinique slaves escaped to the English colonies and slave uprisings became more common on the island itself. It was during the French Revolution of 1848 that the Second Republic declared the abolition of slavery in all French colonies. But it would take a general revolt in St. Pierre to make abolition a reality. In the decades that followed, Martinique became a major processor of sugar and distiller of rum. French colonists enjoyed self-governance, had representatives in the French Senate, and the Republic took responsibility for their welfare and prosperity. Residents of the French West Indies had many advantages over their neighbors in the British West Indies. Education, infrastructure, health, economic opportunities, and a say in running of the French nation. By 1901, Martinique had a population approaching 200,000 people, and St. Pierre, its largest city, was home to more than 26,000. Many turn-of-the-century writers referred to St. Pierre as Little Paris, or the Paris of the Antilles. It was a colorful and picturesque tropical town with two- and three-story masonry homes, with red-tile roofs and gardens and courts landscaped with lush tropical plants and a degree of craftsmanship that astounded many visiting Americans of the time. There was electricity, local telephone, and intercontinental telegraph service. There were banks, business offices, and a daily newspaper. The main streetcar line featured women conductors, and its theater rivaled many others of its kind from the major metropolises of the world. But like many other beautiful cities, it sits in a seismically active area. Thousands of feet beneath the Lesser Antilles, the string of islands that Martinique belongs to, the slow but relentless creep of the Atlantic floor was driving a wedge through the Caribbean continental plate and squeezing a huge bulge of hot magma to the surface. Over time, the magma would explode to the surface as lava, then cool and return to its solidified state as rock. That is the pattern of an active volcano. Millions of people around the world, including those of us in western Washington, live within the vicinity of a volcano. However, mostly we witness these volcanoes in their dormant state with solidified rock crusts. In the spring of 1902, the solid crusts around the islands of St. Vincent and Martinique began to unplug. Volcanoes erupt due to density and pressure. When the density of the magma is lower than the surrounding rock, the magma will rise. It will rise as far as the density of the magma and weight of the rocks above it allow. As it rises, bubbles will form from the gas dissolving in the magma. These gas bubbles exert tremendous pressure. The pressure helps bring the magma to the surface and forces it into the air, often up to great heights. It's much like shaking up a can of soda. Pressure inside the can is released, and when the can is opened and the contents explode out of the opening. The mountains of Martinique get a lot of rain, as much as 200 inches a year, making them one of the wettest places on earth. Most of that precipitation seeps into underground streams and reservoirs inside the island's ancient volcanoes. During the spring of 1902, the magma beneath the island's surface was heating those underground lakes and streams to a boil. James Watt, the British industrial pioneer who invented the modern steam engine, observed that one quart of water set to a boil will produce 1,700 quarts of steam. That's a lot of energy. It is enough to fuel the Industrial Revolution, but it is also the same kind of energy found in a volcano. In spring of 1902, expanding steam was forcing hot subterranean water to the surface of northern Martinique, and the first evidence of the ominous events to come were apparent to the residents of St. Pierre. In June 1901, Louis Moutet was appointed governor of Martinique. He spent a lifetime working his way up the ranks of French colonial government. He was acting governor of Senegal, governor fourth class of the Ivory Coast, governor third class of French Guiana, and finally governor second class of Martinique. Within a year of taking up his appointment, Moutet was caught up in local political affairs. The white colonial oligarchy managed to maintain their grasp of economic power even after the abolition of slavery and the extension of voting rights to all French citizens. They were opposed by a majority population of blacks and mulattoes who made up the middle and lower classes. One of those fiery politicians of the middle class was Amadi Knight. Knight was Martinique's elected senator to the French parliament. He was the first black man to hold that office. As senator, he pushed for reforms in education, housing, and employment. In 
Knight had little appreciation for Motet, the appointed white governor from another colony. In fact, Knight was pushing hard for the office to be elected rather than appointed. Another election was coming up in May 1902. Knight's Senate seat was not being contested, but a seat in the lower house, the Chamber of Deputies, was up for grabs. Knight was working furiously to get the member of his radical party elected to the chamber. Traces of volcanic activity around Mount Pele had been scant since the last eruption in 1851. In 1901, a group of picnickers peered down into the crater and noticed fumes rising from a small opening at the base of a dead tree and the distinct smell of sulfur. They shared this observation with others, but nothing much else was thought of it. A professor, Gaston Landis, at the Lycée Colonial in St. Pierre, was noticing wisps of rising vapor through his telescope coming from the mountain's crater. On April 2, 1902, he noticed a marked increase in activity. Clouds of steam and smoke were rising from the upper valley of the Rivière Blanche. In the weeks that followed, beetles, rodents, and poisonous vipers abandoned the flanks of the mountain and made for the villages below. Cattle became skittish and the dogs barked at night. A change in the direction of the wind could bring up a noxious cloud of sulfur. Landis studied up on volcanoes at the school's library. Information on volcanoes at that time was very limited. Accounts from such places were from Hawaii and Iceland. The most dangerous thing to be feared, the account stated, was the flow of molten lava. But as lava moved very slowly, it was easy to avoid with sufficient warning. Landis realized if activity picked up, he would need to send a cable to Paris and the experts there for further advice. On April 22nd, the island witnessed a small earthquake. By April 23rd, all residents in the northern half of the island could feel the land trembling and see the columns of dark ash billowing from the lower crater. The strong smell of sulfur was now unavoidable. On April 24th, the residents of St. Pierre awoke to an unusual sight. There was a dusting of fine white ash over everything, as if there had been a light snowfall. That was followed by bursts of steam and ash. On the morning of April 25th, the atmosphere reverberated with a series of detonations. Landis ran to his telescope. He could see small rocks shooting out from the crater as far as 1,000 feet. For two hours, a huge gray cloud poured out from the volcano. One resident, Julian Romain, took his horse up to the edge of the crater. Peering down inside, instead of seeing the normally placid crystal blue waters of L'Etang de Palmiste, he saw a pool of dark liquid bubbling like a witch's brew. Romain thought little of this sight, believing the lake was still too far below the edge of the crater to raise any concern. On April 27th, a party of five decided to investigate the lower crater. There they discovered that what had once been a dry lake was now a frothing brew of silvery gray liquid, 600 feet in diameter and apparently very deep. A cinder cone had developed inside the crater, and boiling water was gushing from it. There were ashes everywhere, and all of the plant life was dead. When they returned home, they made a surreal discovery. All of the silver they were wearing whether watch fobs or coins in their pockets, had tarnished. On that same day, the first round of elections were held for the offices in the Chamber of Deputies. Turnout was normal. 46% of the eligible voters cast ballots. The conservative white plantation owner, Fernand Clare, topped the balloting with 4,495 votes. The radical candidate was second with 4,167 votes. And the socialist workers candidate garnered 753 votes. Since no one had won a majority of votes, there would have to be a runoff election between the top two vote-getters. The date of that election would be May 11th. If the people who voted Socialist Worker ended up voting mostly for the radical candidate as expected, the delegation that included Knight would be composed of a majority of radicals. Andreas Herard, the conservative publisher of the island's daily newspaper, Les Colonnais, knew that he and his businessman colleagues would need to do whatever possible to get voters to turn out on May 11th. 
April 28th was mostly a quiet day at Mount Pele, the only remarkable event being that all of the local streams had swollen, even though it hadn't rained in several days, and the Rivière Blanche had taken on a dark coloration. To modern volcanologists, this would have been a dire warning sign, but the mood in St. Pierre was that the worst had passed. Later that day, the usually quiet rivers of Rock Salane and De Paris swelled into raging torrents. The sudden, massive flash floods carried boulders and tree trunks into the city and washed away several women who had been cleaning their laundry along the river banks. To further confuse matters, a hard rain fell that night and the river waters actually receded. By the morning of May 1st, all was quiet again, and the St. Pierre marketplace was filling up with vendors and customers. A puffy white cloud ringed the mountaintop, a completely normal occurrence. Then there was a deep growl from within the mountain. The white cloud turned black and expanded outward. The black cloud mushroomed and blew off. A fine ash dusted the town and the danger moved on. That night, while the municipal band played in St. Pierre's town square, the people of Prichere, to the west of the mountain, were overcome by fumes and ashes. On Friday, May 2nd, there was a driving, pounding thunderstorm that deluged the city with wet ashes. The clouds from the storm also managed to obscure the large, ominous column of smoke pouring out of the mountaintop. The ash in the cloud mixed with the rain and fell on the town like a thick, cement-like paste. The skies were so dark that day, residents needed to light lamps to see their way around. The schools were closed and just before midnight there was a series of violent ground tremors and brilliant lightning flashes. Many parishioners fled to the church to pray. The next morning a tremendous black cloud enveloped the northern half of the island, and the people of the village of Mornay Rouge had to navigate through ankle-deep ash. That night, Governor Moutet decided to investigate. He took a small boat to the village of Prichere. There he discovered that roofs were beginning to collapse under the accumulated weight of the ash. To calm down the residents of the island, the governor offered people the assurance that refuge would be provided in the military barracks should the situation warrant. He made this promise even though he did not have the authority to quarter civilians in military barracks. But getting such permission from the central government in Paris would take weeks, if not months. He also could have spoken directly to the army commanders on the island, but he decided the situation had not called for such action. There is evidence that Moutet did send a telegram to Paris notifying them of volcanic activity on the island ten days before the actual eruption, and a second telegram may have been sent on May 3rd. The actual cables were lost. At that time it was very common to receive such announcements from the colonies. Governors needed to show that they were on alert. However, unless immediate assistance was requested, no action would be taken. Those receiving the telegram did not want to share the responsibility of a false alarm. Therefore, no assistance was sent by the central government. The newspaper publisher, Andreas Herard, certainly wasn't concerned. He knew that most of the voters backing his candidate lived in the towns, particularly that of St. Pierre, while those voters likely to back the opposing candidate lived outside of the towns. The volcano was causing a panic, but the elections had not been postponed. If Herard played his cards right, he could negate the rural vote, while keeping the city voters right where they were. On May 3rd, he published the following article. Mount Pele and St. Pierre. Yesterday, the people of St. Pierre were treated to a grand spectacle from our majestic smoking volcano. While lovers of beauty could not take their eyes from the volcano's ash cloud and the ensuing falls of cinder, more timid souls in St. Pierre were committing their souls to God. It would seem that many signs have warned us that Mount Pele is in a state of serious eruption. There were slight earthquake shocks this noon. The rivers are in overflow. The need now is for the people outside of St. Pierre to seek the shelter of the town. Citizens of St. Pierre, it is your duty to give these people succor and comfort. Later that day, an evacuation of people from the countryside to the town of St. Pierre took place. Women and children covered in gray ash took all they could. According to one observer, great black lads strode along, bent double, under the mattresses needed for the coming nights. Factories, shops, and businesses outside of the town closed. On May 4th, the conservative candidate, Fernand Clare, 
pleaded with other prominent townspeople, including the mayor, to take the volcano seriously and petition the governor to evacuate St. Pierre. Already more than 20 people had been swept out to sea by the unpredictable rivers. Birds and small animals were dropping dead and the overpowering smell of sulfur was ever present. Unfortunately for Claire and the people of St. Pierre, his rhetorical skills were less than persuasive. The radical party senator, Amadee Knight, was in no mood to agree with him. The mountain will only sleep when the whites are out of office, he proclaimed to his supporters. On the evening of May 4th, the tiny brook, called Rivere Falaise, turned into a rampaging current. The flash floods killed dozens of people in the nearby villages, and news of this tragedy began to filter into St. Pierre. Clara Prentiss, American wife of the U.S. consul in Martinique, wrote to her sister, The atmosphere in town is strained. There are outbreaks of stealing and fighting. Troops are on hand to keep order, and my husband Thomas says they are succeeding. Yet most people, in spite of it all, are content to stay in town. This morning there was a small exodus from here, but now it has stopped. People sleep where they can, in the streets, even against the walls of our home. On the afternoon of May 5th, the sea abruptly receded, exposing the harbor floor. The exposed harbor revealed the rusted hulks of old machinery, fishing boats that were sunk during the hurricane of 1891, and items of cargo that had fallen overboard from decades past. Residents, having experienced tsunamis in the past, headed for higher ground. Within minutes, the sea returned with an enormous swell that flooded the streets of the waterfront with up to five feet of water. Shortly thereafter, Auguste Guerin, a rum distillery owner, was warned by his factory foreman to run for his life. An avalanche was headed their way. Guerin later described the event. Then I heard a noise I can't compare with anything else, an immense noise, like the devil on earth, a black avalanche beneath white smoke, an enormous mass more than 30 feet high and about 500 feet wide, full of huge boulders, was coming down the mountain with a great din. My unfortunate son and his wife ran away from it toward the shore. All at once the mud arrived. It passed within 25 feet of me. I felt its deathly breath. There was a great crashing sound. Everything was crushed, drowned, and submerged. My son, his wife, and thirty other people, and huge buildings were all swept away. Three of those black waves came down, making a noise like thunder, and made the sea retreat. Under the impact of the third wave, a boat moored in the factory harbor was thrown over a wall. The desolation was indescribable. Where a prosperous factory, the work of my lifetime, had stood a moment before, there was now nothing left but the expanse of mud forming a black shroud for my son, his wife, and my workmen. The mud was saturated volcanic ash. The origin of the avalanche appeared to be the collapse of a section of the Eton Sec crater, which unleashed a torrent of boiling water and mud. The mud was traveling as fast as 90 feet per second, or 60 miles per hour. There was no chance of outrunning it. More than 150 people were buried alive. Today we refer to this phenomenon as a lahar, the Javanese word for lava. But in actuality, a lahar isn't lava. It occurs when rising magma displaces groundwater, and the result is a frantic rush of ash mud headed for the nearest level's surface. That night, a bank of electric generators at the power station failed when they clogged with ash. Half of St. Pierre was plunged into darkness. On the morning of May 6th, Mayor Fouché hung posters all over the walls of St. Pierre. Citizens were assured that there was no immediate danger. They were advised to continue their normal activities and not to give in to panic. There was a promise that no lava flow would reach the city, and that any future events would be localized to areas outside the town. Meanwhile, Governor Moutet had just returned to Fort de France from a desperate scene at Prichère where frantic residents nearly sank his boat in their attempt to flee the volcano. He was forced to abandon his landing and return to the capital. When he reached the telegraph office, he put in an immediate request to Paris for him to be given command of the naval cruiser Suchet. It was the largest ship available for evacuating people. That night, Professor Landis looked through his telescope at the Eton Sec crater. The clouds above the crater glowed with a reddish-orange color projecting from below. 
What Landis did not know was that the coloration indicated that a vent had opened in the volcano that went straight to the Earth's mantle. Enormous globs of molten rock and huge boulders were shooting out of the crater. Mount Pele was about to blow. May 7th began with heavy explosions and intense lightning bursts. The ground trembled and shook as hundreds of new refugees made their way into St. Pierre. Publisher Herard also noticed a large number of St. Pierre residents fleeing the city for Fort de France. In an article he published that day, he wrote, We confess that we cannot understand this panic. Where better could one be than in St. Pierre? Do those who invade Fort de France believe that they will be better off there than here should the earth begin to quake? This is a foolish error in which the populace should be warned. The influx of new refugees into St. Pierre was becoming a problem. There was not enough shelter, and people were forced to sleep in churches, parks, cemeteries, and even in the streets. Food supplies were arriving, but they weren't enough. Fights were breaking out. The mayor requested more police presence from the governor, and the governor promised to send a detachment of 30 soldiers. But this action had the result of worsening the situation, as many refugees thought the police were sent to blockade them inside St. Pierre. Moutet organized a scientific commission to investigate the dangers of the volcano and to determine if the evacuation of St. Pierre would be necessary. He brought together a military expert, a civil engineer, and two science professors, including Gaston Landis. The military expert concluded that the volcano, lacking the characteristics of a cannon, could not propel a boulder as far as the town, and that the people of St. Pierre and the other villages would be safe from projectiles. The civil engineer concluded that evacuation by land would be extremely difficult, and those unfit enough for a long slog would be left behind. He also determined that based on past experience, the island could withstand an earthquake, that the best way to fight a fire would be to not evacuate the town, so that there would be sufficient volunteers to extinguish the fires. The professor with the background in chemistry declared that the stories of horses dying in the streets from inhaling fumes were merely rumors, and that nothing smaller than a bird can be confirmed as dying from the fumes. When it was Landis's turn to report, he admitted that he had just taken up the study of volcanoes, and that scientific information on volcanoes was very scarce. But he guaranteed that any flooding and mud flows would be confined to valleys and ravines. When asked by the governor, he said the same regarding lava flows. Yet something still bothered Landis. There had never been anything like the mud flow that killed 150 people at Garen's distillery. Landis was worried that there were too many unknowns regarding the volcano. Moutet asked him to be more specific about his reservations, but Landis could not offer anything specific. The field of volcano science was just too new. Moutet concluded that based on the commission's report, the city of St. Pierre should not be evacuated. Shortly after 8 a.m. on May 8th, Mount Pele erupted. There were two almost simultaneous blasts. The first blast discharged vertically, blowing out steam and ash to an altitude of seven miles. The second blast exploded sideways, sending a huge pyroclastic surge, or nuée ardente, down the mountain's southwestern flank. A black cloud shot upwards, forming an enormous mushroom cloud that darkened the sky for a 50-mile radius. This surge came out of the Etonsec crater. A tremendous cloud of hot ash and superheated steam poured out of the volcano in the direction of St. Pierre. On its way down the mountainside, it incinerated the villages of St. Philomene and Foncor. It blew through all terrain, high ground and low ground. Everyone in the region heard the roar of the volcano, and everyone had time enough to realize what was about to happen. The massive cloud was racing down the hillside at 120 miles per hour, and would cover the four miles from the cone to the town in two minutes. At the first sign of trouble, some residents ran for the waterfront, while others sought refuge within the nearest building. It would be of no use. The massive superheated cloud hit the city like an avalanche, flattening the sturdiest buildings and burying the occupants within the structures. The average temperature inside the cloud was 700 degrees Fahrenheit, with pockets as hot as 1300 degrees. Those who tried to outrun the surge were caught from behind and catapulted through the air as if shot by a cannon. 
Taking a single breath of the steam instantly and fatally seared the lungs. The steam burned people's flesh until it was black in color. It took a full three minutes for the massive cloud to pass through St. Pierre. As it passed through, the superheated cloud burned up the oxygen in the atmosphere, causing a vacuum that temporarily choked the survivors. The vacuum was soon filled by gale force winds. Any combustible material left in the rubble burst into flames, including thousands of barrels of rum. The resulting fire burned for the next three days. Fernand Clare, the political candidate, observed the horror from his house on a hillside above town. There was a continuous roar, blended with staccato beats like the throbbing, pulsating sounds of a gatling gun. It grew so dark that I could only be sure of the presence of my wife and children by groping for them with my hands. His wife Veronica also witnessed the disaster. We saw a sea of fire cutting through the billowing black smoke and advancing along the ground toward the town. What could we do? We held each other close. We wanted to die together and were waiting for death. It was a moment of anguish, fear, lack of air. I know not what was the cause of the choking in my throat. It was raining stones and mud, lumps of mud as big as coils of rope. St. Pierre was doomed. Our friends were doomed. Our world was doomed. Father Alter Roche watched with horror from his vantage point on the mountain of Mornvert. A column of fire, which I estimated to be at least 1,200 feet in height, descended upon the town. It engulfed the statue of Christ in the cemetery. Then it doubled back on itself, traveling the way it had come, but this time extending into the roadstead, reaching out for the ships berthed there. Before my eyes I saw the steamer, the grappler, disappear, and then the whole town vanished under the great wall of fire. Father J. Mary witnessed the devastation from the nearby town of Mont Rouge. I beheld the black vapor leap from the side of the mountain. Looking down on it as it rolled onto St. Pierre, it seemed to me as if all of Martinique was sliding into the sea. A great tongue of fire seemed to detach itself from the vapor to lick up all the water from the Roxelaine River. The fiery mass was being constantly refueled by a huge stream of fire pouring out of the side of the crater to ravage an already devastated town. The cane fields were on fire, as were the plantations around the town. Most of the more than 30,000 victims died instantly or within minutes of the onslaught. The less fortunate were at the fringe of the blast. Many of those people suffered through horrendous pain for hours or days before succumbing to their burns. The catastrophe destroyed an area nearly 12 miles square. It did not stop at the coastline, but continued on until all its energy was used. Ships in the harbor were incinerated, blown apart or sank. Survivors were left waiting for rescue, horribly burned and clinging to debris. Inside the zone of destruction, the annihilation of life and property was total. Outside was a second, clearly defined area where there were casualties, but the material damage was less, while beyond this lay a strip in which vegetation was scorched but life was spared. Many victims died with a casual demeanor, their features calm and reposeful, indicating that death had overtaken them without warning and without pain. Others were contorted in anguish. The clothing was torn from nearly all the victims struck down out of doors. Most of the houses were pulverized. It was impossible, even for persons familiar with the city, to identify the foundations of the city landmarks. Twenty minutes before the eruption, Governor Moutet set off on a steam launch with three other members of the Science Commission for the town of Prichere. It was their mission to determine if the small town of 4,000 inhabitants would need to be evacuated. They never made it. Having just left the docks of St. Pierre, Moutet's boat was crushed by the force of the pyroclastic surge, which set the vessel on fire before sinking it. He and the other commission members all died. However, the town of Prichere was just outside the path of destruction, and most of its inhabitants were unharmed by the blast. Gaston Landis was not on that boat. He had stayed at his home several hundred feet up the hillside from St. Pierre. Landis was on the fringe of the destruction zone. His body was completely burned and blood ran from his nose and mouth. To the end, he had regretted not being more forceful about the need to evacuate St. Pierre. <laughs>
A few days later, he died from his injuries. Andreas Herard, the newspaper publisher who appealed to the people of St. Pierre to stay put, while encouraging those from the surrounding countryside to come to St. Pierre, died in town along with the citizens, refugees, and the governor's wife. Fernand Clare and his family survived the disaster at their home, which was beyond the path of destruction. He was one of the few voices calling for evacuation. Everybody who was in St. Pierre on the morning of May 8th died from the blast. Everybody, that is, except for one person. On May 11th, three days after the eruption, two people were rooting about the rubble of the town, looting most likely, when they heard the muffled cries of a man coming from a cell where the prison had once been. The man's name was Auguste C. Perez, but he preferred to be called Sanson. C. Perez had been locked up in solitary confinement in the small cell, which had an arched roof, one-foot-thick walls, and was built into the side of a hill. For all the reasons that the prison cell was constructed to keep a prisoner from escaping were all the reasons why C. Perez was the lone survivor of the blast. C. Perez did not hear the volcano explode. His first indication that something had happened was when hot ash began to pour into his cell. The ash made him cough and gag, so he took off his shirt and urinated on it and draped this around his head to keep from choking. He suffered minor burns, but was not overcome by the steam or gases. He later became a traveling attraction as part of Barnum and Bailey's circus, displaying his scars and recounting his ever-changing tale as the lone survivor of the Great Volcano. So, was the destruction of St. Pierre and all its inhabitants avoidable? Certainly there was nothing then or now that could be done to prevent a volcano from erupting. But 30,000 people died, and there had been no organized effort to evacuate the town. Governor Moutet was not a thoughtless or careless man. Evacuation was no simple matter. Transporting 30,000 people on an island in the early 1900s was no easy project. Just trying to find sufficient ships would have been extremely hard. And then there was the difficulty of securing food and housing for all the evacuees. That would be a logistical nightmare in the 21st century, let alone the turn of the last century. And what if the volcano didn't erupt? All of those people evacuated, and the town and all its contents left unguarded. Evacuation is no easy decision. Ask any political leader today who has had to make the call in the face of potential disaster. To order evacuation when no disaster hits, or to not order evacuation when one does, is about the worst crisis a leader can face. Give Moutant credit for gathering the opinions of the best scientific minds available to him, and that his last effort was to care for the safety of the people of Prichair. No one had documented a pyroclastic surge prior to the eruption of Mount Pele. How could he or any of the inhabitants of the island know what was about to happen? The destruction of St. Pierre was unavoidable. But scientists have learned so much as a result of that eruption. When a volcano starts to rumble, molten lava should be the least of your concerns. Thank you for joining me for the podcast of Doom. Please feel free to comment regarding your thoughts by emailing me at podcastofdoom, P-O-D, at gmail.com. Or visit me at www.thepodcastofdoom.com. I encourage you to go to the website. It has a very handsome and distinguished looking donate button, and I promise that if you click it, all sorts of wonderful things will happen. Next week, we will look at the toxic gas leak in Bhopal, India. Until then, keep your ears pinned and your tail taut.